Hey, hello everyone. I'm Michael Perch. I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Austin working in data analytics and machine learning. I have a course on machine learning and this is lecture number eight. It's not really number eight. There was a bunch of kind of five A's and B's and so forth, but we are now going to get into dimensionality reduction. This is the second lecture in inferential machine learning. And so we'll talk specifically about principal component analysis. But before we get there, we really should have some discussion around the curse of dimensionality. Now we covered that back in one of the five lectures on feature selection. I'll just do a quick reminder and then I'll get into dimensionality reduction strategies. I'll stop the video then and I will start up again with a second video on principal component analysis. All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. What's the motivation? Why do we want to do this? We work with highly multivariate data sets. We must. It's part of our jobs and it's the fascinating world we live in that we are surrounded by data with many different features and they're multivariate. Projection to, projection to a lower dimension may improve our interpretability and modeling accuracy. Specifically, it helps us to avoid overfit and multicollinearity but also it allows us to be able to provide opportunities for feature engineering, working with features that have more information that provide us with models that are simpler, more interpretable, easier to work with. Maybe they run faster, maybe for storage, it's easier to store the results. There's lots of good reasons to try to do dimensionality reduction. So the curse of dimensionality, now we've already covered this, so I don't, I don't want to repeat that. Go back and check out that lecture 5b or something like that you'll see feature reduction you'll, you'll see it better than i can see right now but let's go ahead and just make a couple of comments first comment in review here is the fact that we are driven to more and more and more features in the subsurface why is that well first of all we are moving beyond traditional modeling workflows we're trying to now model the entire earth system we're trying to be able to close a lot of loops we want to be able to build models that are consistent with all the geophysical information, all the production information, with all the petrophysical information. We need to start modeling all of the required variables in order to run the Ford models, the physics-based models, on our models of the subsurface for the purpose of ensuring that we honor or match. It's closing the loop. Use the data to build the model, run the Ford physics on your model, and see if you still honor that physics-driven data. Uh, pretty fascinating stuff. It's very, very cool. In addition to that, unconventionals, of course, have driven us to work with multivariate, um, more variables, I should say, because there is more things to measure in unconventionals. We're concerned specifically about frac fracture propagation. We're concerned with the maturity of the rock and so forth. And so we have a bunch more features we're looking at. As I've heard from many good geoscientists working in this field, they're still looking for the secret sauce. They're trying to figure out exactly what contributes best to production. It's a tough problem. All right, when we work multivariate, it's very challenging to visualize to detect relationships and patterns. It's easier if we can get to lower dimensionality. The curse of dimensionality can be summarized as follows. It's harder to visualize when you have many, many features or variables to work with. High dimensional space is hard to look at. More data required to infer all of the joint probabilities, the sampling problem. The coverage problem is you just have less coverage, higher dimensionality with your data. You don't explore as much of the space. More difficult to interrogate and check the models, more likely to have redundant features, which will lead to model instability up to multicollinearity problems. Very difficult to detect and be able to figure out more complicated, more likely overfit. All right, I'm not gonna actually cover all of the cursed dimensionality slides again. I'm gonna skip through them, but I will make this statement right here. It is better to work with fewer, more informative features than to throw everything and the kitchen sink into the model. Fewer features, the model simpler, faster, easier to visualize, and less likely overfit. Okay, about methods for dimensionality reduction. And then we'll go ahead and get in the principal components specifically. Okay, so dimensionality reduction. 
motivated by the curse of dimensionality multicollinearity known as dimension reduction or dimensionality reduction and it's applied in statistics machine learning information theory there's multiple strategies that we can use the first strategy is just pick the best features to work with we covered that back in lecture five point something find a subset of the original features that have the most important for the problem add the most value and so forth feature projection is different transform the data from a higher to a low dimensional space is what we do with feature projection now feature selection let's make let's just make a couple of comments around there you could consider a wide array approach to assess feature importance i'm a fan of that because one single approach will only tell you a piece of the information but if you take a wide array and apply a variety of different methods with an understanding of what they represent their limitations you can start to really explore and understand your data by doing that. And we tried to communicate that, tried to communicate that back in the feature selection chapter. We use visual inspection. If you want to sound cool, say ocular inspection, put that on your report, but you're looking at it. That's fine. Of the data distributions, the scatter plots, summary statistics, and so forth. Summary statistics, all different types, metrics, different moments, and so forth. We've talked about that. I have a bunch more on summary statistics in my introduction to Geostats course if you're interested, but that's pretty common knowledge, of course. Model-based approaches, I like that. That's cool. You fit a model and then you use the model to help you figure it out. Example, multi-linear multi regression. And if you first standardize the variables, you'll get beta coefficients, where in fact are just the coefficients applied to each feature. And you can use that to assess the importance. Recursive feature elimination is pretty cool. You build its model based again, but it's a unique type where you take all of the features, you build the model, use the coefficients, the metric, the actual model parameters, or maybe in some cases, like when we're working with ensemble tree based methods and they actually tell us the importance. Then we can use those measures from the models to go ahead and rank the features from best from from best to worst and then what we'll do is we'll just remove the worst then we repeat remove the worst repeat remove the worst yeah it's like a tournament of sorts and you see which features win got to be careful got to build the model well and i would recommend that you use methodologies that are close to the type of modeling method we'll use in the end you after all you want to know the performance relative to a specific modeling methodology and assumptions behind it now expert knowledge if we're going to talk about feature selection let's leave this in here and make sure we make this statement we should be using domain expertise let's be data scientists Do you remember the venn diagram domain expertise statistics and machine learning and coding down below we want to make sure that we are using our knowledge of the setting it would be silly if you were working with a subsurface data set and you had permeability measures and you were to go ahead and remove them because you just have a small sample size and you can't see the important structures and you remove permeability when you're actually trying to make a prediction of flow if you understood the physics you'd know that you never build a model for subsurface flow without incorporating permeability information if additional information is known about the physics and the processes, causation, reliability, and availability of the features, this should be integrated into any feature ranking. We should be learning as we perform the analysis. Don't be bothered by that. In fact, our, our path, our journey in our projects is likely not going to be linear. It's drawn linear often for simplicity, but as we talked about in like lecture number one, I think, we should expect some iteration. I like to call it learning while modeling. And here's an example right here for an unconventional data set. We looked at multiple features. I'm not going to keep going on this, but this is something that we covered previously in that lecture five. But let's just make sure this is in our minds that we could also do feature selection. Now, feature projection is another approach to dimensionality reduction. What you do is you transform your M features into a lower dimensional space in other words we reduce it to a smaller subset of features usually based as a combination of those other features so if given we have originally x1 through xm features 
We know we would require, just imagine just trying to understand the bivariate plots, the bivariate relationships, two by two. We would have m times m minus 1 divided by 2 unique scatter plots that we could look at to try to understand the relationship. Once we get to four more variables, this gets to be a lot of information. And so if we can try to reduce that through future projection, that's pretty powerful. We're going to find a good lower dimensional space. We start it with m original dimensions or features, and we're going to get ourselves down to p. Now the benefit is, first and foremost, imagine if we had 100 features and we get ourselves down to 25 features. We have reduced the storage requirements by, we have removed literally 75% of the storage that we would have been working with. And in addition to that, it's likely the computational time will also go down with any methodology that we use with that reduced dimensionality subset. Visualization is much easier. Boy, if you can get it down to two features, if p is equal to two, you can just look at the data, look at the system. Modeling with p much less than m features automatically will take care of multicollinearity. If there is multicollinearity, that'll be captured and it'll be removed and we'll end up with a combination of those original features, which will incorporate all the information that they were previously sharing in with redundancy. So that's really powerful. Limitation may be more difficult to understand. You had porosity, permeability, um, vitronite reflectance, impedance, and so forth. Now you have component one, component two, component three, and four. And they're going to be combinations of the original features. So they will lose their physical meaning. And so that is, that's a significant drawback. You'll see from the workflows that we're about to present, we will do the statistics and the machine learning in the lower dimensional space, but we always come back because at the end of the day, you have to model with permeability, porosity, and so forth. You can't model with those components. You can't. And everything we do in machine learning is to add value. We need to make predictions, right? So we need to do that. Okay. There's a variety of methods that we can employ and I'll list um, just a set of methods right now, but spoiler alert, as I said before, we're going to do principal component analysis basically the whole time. Principal component analysis, we're going to cover this linear mapping of the data to a lower dimensional space maximizes the variance explained by the reduced subset of features. Super awesome. Variance is the signal within the system, right? So that's, that's pretty powerful. Kernel principal component analysis is really cool actually. What we do here, it's a nonlinear mapping of the data to a higher dimensional space with the kernel trick. When we get into support vector machines, we're going to spend a chapter or a subset of a chapter talking about the kernel trick. We use a kernel function to operate in a higher dimensional feature space with only the requirement of knowing, given the kernel transform, what is the measure of similarity between all the data paired points. That's super powerful. All we need is that effectively similarity matrix. And we can go ahead and do all of our math in this higher dimensional space without actually ever calculating the features in the higher dimensional space. Kind of trippy, but we'll cover the kernel trick later. So that's a bit of, that's a really cool thing. Um, credit to Stanford, Jeff Kerr's and all his group. They've done a lot of cool stuff with um, multi-dimensional scaling and so forth, looking at um, understanding complicated systems. I know they've done work with the kernel trick before. There's also factor analysis. Now, factor analysis and principal component analysis work by the same idea of a linear combination of features. Now, but what factor analysis does, it focuses on the intercorrelations between the features as opposed to principal components, which focuses on the variance described. Searches for joint variations in response to latent variables. So that's factor analysis. We are not going to cover that here. Nonlinear PCA, this is really super cool. Form an embedded manifold for the data approximation. And so what are we going to do? We're going to actually, if we had a data set like this, this could be our representation, our manifold, and we can project the data into that. Then we'll perform principal components within that space. That manifold is then able to capture nonlinearity and kind of complicated forms and features. And then we can do the linear component on the projection into that space. And so that's pretty powerful stuff. Multidimensional scaling. I, 
a lecture on that that we will cover. So we're going to jump into multidimensional scaling right after principal component analysis. I really like it. I think it's very powerful. It's part of what's known as ordination. Really what ordination is about is how do we represent complicated data sets in a lower dimensional space so we can visualize and make decisions, understand it. Typically in ordination, you try to get down to two dimensions. Here's an example right here. This is a PhD thesis from Ron Jay, from um, Guillaume Ron Jay, I believe is the name, PhD thesis. If I remember right, I believe I was on the PhD thesis committee over there in France. I didn't get to go. I was remotely linked in. But anyway, the cool thing about it was what he did was he built a wide range of different models geostatistically and then was able to evaluate their differences, see how they line up. Very fascinating stuff. Jeff Karras from Stanford has also been talking about this, this idea of projecting models into the space and trying to visualize uncertainty in that space. Very cool stuff. Okay, so that is the end of my discussion, my general discussion about dimensionality reduction. The next lecture will get into principal component analysis and we'll spend a bunch of time on that. I'm set a personal goal not to have really super long videos. I'm not doing very well at that, but anyway, so I'll leave that now. I am Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I record every one of my lectures. I put them on YouTube in the hope that my students will have a resource that's evergreen there for them. They love it. It helps them with preparing for examinations and maybe um, they can slow me down or speed me up. And I know I have such an outrageous Canadian accent in the lecture hall, so maybe um, it'll help them be able to understand my courses. I'm also the Geostat guy on Twitter, on YouTube and on GitHub. So go ahead, check out some of my other content. And if you want to collaborate, if you're a working professional and you want to come spend some time with us, hang out at University of Texas, get some direct mentorship, work with my students. We've been hosting people who do that. And I think that's a great opportunity for students to learn about industry and for industry people to gain more capability in face of this digital transformation. I also do a lot of teaching. I have been working with Datum and we've been teaching all over the place. Contact me if you want to attend some of our training opportunities. All right. I hope that was helpful. Hey, take care.